Okay, since no one reacts, uh, I assume I can start. Uh, there are many um, ways to uh, perform approximations to uh, model gravitational waves in general relativity, but uh, I could not cover all those analytical approaches. And due to the lack of time, I decided to focus on my main expertise domain, that is the post-Newtonian approach, as well as the self-force calculations. Let us consider a gravitational wave signal. It's a field, a function of x and t, in an appropriate radiative gauge, ring as one over r, and usually it is decomposed in a multiple uh, way. So the multiple moments are u and v, they are called the radiative multiple moments, and the angular part here is encoded in the tensor product of the unit vector n, linking the source to the observer, and you see that uh, this vector depends on the angle theta and phi. This is indeed the angular dependence. Here you have L minus two such vectors. And so this is a, a L multipolarity moment of type mass and current. At leading order, because of the factor one over C L minus two here, you recover a more familiar formula. Notice the TT projector here and here. Uh, noticing that uh, uij is actually the second derivative of the quadrupole. This is indeed the Einstein quadrupole formula. And uh, I would like to remind you, this is just a representation equivalent to the one in terms of the H plus and H cross polarization. And we want to compute ul and vl as a function of the source. This is the problem. And to tackle the problem, uh, we have uh, several uh, approximations uh, we can use. Uh, I will start with the post-Newtonian one. Uh, this uh, approximation uh, is in terms of a small parameter v over c square, where v is the typical velocity of the system. And so for binary systems, important for gravitational waves, uh, this is uh, valid for large separations. As you can see on the diagram here, this is the separation and this is the mass ratio. And uh, you can use uh, perturbation theory uh, for whatever separation, provided the mass ratio is sufficiently large or small uh, if you take the inverse uh, of it. And uh, a, with numerical relativity, you can handle uh, not very large separations due to the computational time. However, you can go to, to the merger of the binary system you cannot go either to very uh, high mass ratios due to uh, uh, the resources that we take. And you have an overlap between those approximations, notably between the post-Newtonian theory and the perturbation theory in the far uh, separation regime uh, for extreme mass ratio. I will uh, explain a few general things about uh, post-Newtonian radiation of isolated systems focus then on compact binaries, discussing the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian approach, and say a few words about gravitational self-force calculation. Let us start with the post-Newtonian approximation. Uh, we consider a region of space-time and a system where all uh, the velocities at play are much smaller than one, and this maximal v divided by c squared is our small parameter. And it's easy to check that then there exists a region of space-time, and notably of space, such that uh, uh, this region encloses the system, and it has a diameter much smaller than uh, the wavelength. In this region, you may expand retardations in the gravitational field, and you have the post-Newtonian solution of the uh, Einstein field equations. Then you can uh, also solve the problem of uh, the generation of the field uh, in the exterior zone. Uh, then uh, multiple expansion is possible. And to make the computation doable, you use uh, also the post-Minkowskian expansion, in powers of uh, the gravitational constant G. Uh, the post-Newtonian approximation uh, departs from the real metric solution 
uh, when you are too far from the near zone. Uh, conversely, the post-Minkowskian in green uh, solution, the multipolar post-Minkowskian solution, uh, actually diverges uh, at the origin, but uh, it becomes very accurate in the exterior zone. We uh, use conveniently for general systems, not necessarily binary systems, a formulation in harmonic coordinates. We uh, take the harmonic gauge condition where H is the deviation of the Gothic metric with respect to the flat metric. And we obtain a wave type equations. This is the flat box operator with a, an effective uh, pseudo stress energy tensor containing notably the nonlinearities of the Einstein equations. And we search uh, their post-Newtonian solutions in uh, this uh, expanded form, with 1 over Cm here. If the previous orders are known to construct the current order, what we do is that uh, we uh, have to solve uh, this equation formally with a retarded integral. However, because it's a post-Newtonian expansion here, we have to expand this integral. But the correct prescription is to put a kernel, uh, r divided by a cutoff r0, where r is the distance to the origin, to a certain power <coughs> b, compute the integral, and then take the finite part of this kernel, compute the expanded retarded integral. Uh, there is the appearance of r0, but r0 appears also in a homogeneous solution. So the first solution is a particular solution of the equation. This is a homogeneous solution, regular everywhere, depending on some multiple moments here. And those multiple moments depend on r0, as I said, and they are functionals of the multiple expansion of the metric. So they encode somehow the boundary conditions uh, far from the system. And uh, this is a kind of back reaction uh, related to the back reaction of those exterior zone effects to the system. Now, uh, you can uh, also solve the exterior zone problem. Uh, it's easier because it's in vacuum somehow. So you can use a combination between the post-Minkowskian expansion metric search under this form and the multipolar expansion. Uh, you a linear order search for the linear solution of the vacuum equation here uh, and the general solution as the form of a sum of derivative of a spherical wave. And if you want to impose the gauge condition, you find that the most general solution actually is parameterized by six sets of multiple moments, the source moments, uh, mass and current type source moments and the gauge moments. Knowing the linear order, you can uh, iterate and obtain the order n uh, by applying uh, the finite part regularized retarded integral, as I explained in the previous slide, to the source. Uh, in fact, the nth post Minkowskian order of the source. And you must also take into account some homogeneous outgoing solution of this type, actually, in order to guarantee that the divergence of h mu nu is zero. So this uh, makes a connection between the source and the waveform in the following way. By asymptotic matching, you can compute actually uh, as a uh, volume integral over the post-Newtonian source, uh, the uh, source moments, and then you can relate them to the uh, radiative moments. More precisely, uh, using some intermediate canonical moments and coding the same information as the source moments, you can write UL and VL, uh, similarly, in terms of ML and SL, depending themselves of, on IL, and JL, and so on. And so you have uh, this kind of decomposition, uh, an instantaneous contribution, which is made of product of uh, derivatives of the canonical moments, ML and SL, tail and memory contributions, and many more, which are actually uh, her hereditary contribution integrals depending on the past history of the system. The tail term depends weakly on the source past history, whereas the memory term depends uh, strongly on this history. Uh, the tail effect can be understood in the following way. Here is a radiation, a wave emitted by the system. Um, the space-time is not flat. There is a perturbation due to the presence of the source itself. And so there is a backscattering due to this uh, 
curvature produced by the source. Uh, and finally, an observer located here will see not only information coming from uh, the retarded time, but from earlier time if the uh, graviton follows this path. Uh, so uh, this explains the, the path dependence. Uh, notice that you can have a tail effect coming back to the system. This is the back reaction I mentioned before, considering the homogeneous solution of uh, the post-Newtonian equation for the field. Yes, exactly. Yes. I, 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 um, yes, it is determined uniquely, absolutely. So uh, now I focus on uh, the case of compact binaries, uh, some terminology first. So this is the standard uh, flux of the quadrupole formula. This is the standard derivative of the quadrupole. But my point is that in spite of the 1 over C5 factor, we call this Newtonian order. Newtonian means leading order for us, for the flux and for the equations of motion. Uh, balance uh, equations play a crucial uh, role in the formalism. Uh, for instance, you can have uh, the secular evolution uh, using the balance equation for uh, the energy and angular momentum. This tells you, in particular, that the system circularizes uh, for isolated binaries. Uh, the energy and uh, the separation are one, two, uh, between the bodies y1 and y2. The separation decreases at a rate 1 over C5. I wrote it epsilon 5 half. And this is what we call 2.5 post Newtonian order, 2.5 pn. Uh, so uh, it's convenient uh, since the orbits are quasi circular to work in terms of the frequency omega. Uh, this is the Kepler law. This has many corrections. And uh, the state of the art is that now we know the fourth pn order here, in fact, all the observables uh, related to the lo local dynamics are known at that order, uh, notably the energy with the fourth post-Newtonian correction, where x here is the post-Newtonian parameter related to the frequency omega, uh, omega to the power two-thirds. And it turns out that for quasi-circular orbits, those quantities, observable quantities, the energy, flux, uh, polarizations, uh, have uh, gauge invariant expressions in terms of X. So this is a bit a heavy slide, but I will go fast just to give you an idea of the different approaches for the equations of motion and uh, the exterior zone problem. For the equations of motion, you have a first scheme, which is the post Newtonian iteration in harmonic coordinates. Uh, first version of it uses an effective stress energy tensor or actually effective action. Then you can derive the stress energy tensor. Dimensional regularization asymptotic matching. There is a quantum field theory flavored uh, approach uh, similar to the previous one, uh, effective action, dimensional regularization. But we are now in the Fourier space for the calculation. We use Feynman diagram. And uh, asymptotic matching, in, in my view, is replaced uh, by a zero bin subtraction. Uh, and in the American approach, uh, people use perfect fluids. They want to avoid uh, any kind of regularization. And so they split uh, the volume integrals into uh, near zone uh, and uh, exterior zone pieces. Uh, another method consists in avoiding the strong field region near the bodies by transforming some bulk integrals into surface integrals. And uh, finally, uh, there is a method also using dimensional regularization and an effective modeling of the source, but based on the ADM approach, an adaptation to the post-Newtonian approximation. Uh, to tackle the um, exterior zone uh, problem, um, you use uh, generally uh, multipolar post newtonian formalisms. So this is not appropriate for the ADM approach, but you have a regularization-based approach developed by Blanchet, Damour, and Ayer, who played a very important role here. An uh, integral splitting approach, which is uh, the same uh, American uh, regularization-free, let's say, uh, technique uh, as before, uh, but restricting to perfect fluid. Uh, and uh, notice that uh, in the QFT flavored version of the regularization based approach, you can also uh, do those exterior zone calculations. 
The bodies are modeled by plant particles. So this is the world line of one such particle, y mu, with four velocity uh, u mu. There is a tetrad attached to the body. There is a fixed tetrad, and you can relate them with Lorentz matrices. You can construct omega mu nu from that. And the most general action uh, of your uh, system, this is an effective uh, action, uh, must depend on uh, the four velocity omega mu nu, the metric, uh, the Riemann tensor, and its derivative. And so you see it contains, in principle, a non minimal part taking into account the uh, finite size effects. More precisely, uh, you can describe the dynamics uh, in the following way. So let us introduce the covariant uh, Dirac um, uh, density. And uh, you have uh, effective momenta, uh, P mu, S mu nu, uh, defined in this way with the previous uh, action. Uh, you have here the effective quadrupole moment. Uh, defined in this way, octuple moment, and etc. You can continue. They are referred sometimes as the Dixon moments. And you have the stress energy tensor, which is the point particle one, spin corrections uh, involving the derivative of the Dirac distribution. And uh, you have uh, many corrections coming from uh, higher multiple moments. So uh, those are finite size effects, notably second time derivative of the quadrupole, third time of the octuple, and so on. So uh, in the Lagrangian approach, uh, we take more specifically this action. So this is the Einstein-Hilbert action with a gauge fixing term. Here uh, you have the point particle part, including possibly the spins, but I will not consider spins uh, in, in this part uh, later, uh, simplify the discussion. However, I give here two examples of non-minimal non pieces. Uh, the, this is the tidal part of the Lagrangian, for instance. You see uh, this is quadratic in terms of um, uh, tidal uh, multiple moments, uh, here of mass and current types. Those mu sigma are related to the relativistic no love numbers. You can do the same for the spin interactions. Uh, you have derivatives of uh, tidal uh, moments, uh, quadrupolar actually here and this couples to a certain number of spins. You have deformability <laughs> coefficients here. And um, so the D Dixon moments, J, introduced in the previous slide, can be obtained, of course, by differentiating this action and identifying T mu nu obtained in this way with the previous T mu nu. So you can know what are the J, the quadrupole, octuple. Uh, to deal with the motion of the particles, we use the Fokker approach. We start from uh, the action depending on the metric and let's say, forget about spin, uh, the particle world line functionally. And we compute uh, the field solution uh, of the field equations, the relaxed Einstein equations given by this. And we inject the solution inside the original action. And we obtain something depending only on the world line. And in fact, it turns out that the original equations of motion taken for H equal to uh, the solution of the relaxed Einstein field equation with symmetric propagator. So those equations are equivalent to uh, the equations derived from the Fokker Lagrangian. So uh, therefore, you see that this Lagrangian, of course, by Construction is a conservative description of the dynamics. Notice that uh, it's possible to construct uh, the Fokker action in a more uh, quantum uh, field theory way. So we can uh, rewrite uh, the original Lagrangian in terms of uh, scalar uh, degree of freedom for gravitational field, vector and tensor degrees of freedom and put it in this form, notice here the, the kinetic part, the coupling with, uh, with matter and some uh, perturbation of that. And you can compute the path integral and define an effective action in this way. And now it, you can notice that uh, this is essentially a Gaussian integral you have to do, and you can use the saddle point technique. And in this case, you know that the result will be just uh, essentially 
this where you have uh, replaced uh, sorry uh, the original uh, this with the original action where you have replaced um, the uh, field H by the solution of this equation which is the st stationary point so uh, you you can tackle the problem in uh, using the tools of uh, quantum field theory and uh, Feynman diagrams so recently uh, there were some important results concerning the 4PN dynamics. It was entirely determined independently by three groups uh, in ATM, Fokker, and diagrammatic approaches. Um, two types of divergences appeared at 4PN order uh, due to the effective point particle modeling, clearly UV divergences, uh, which are completely unphysical and must cancel each other. Uh, more subtle divergences appeared because you have used the post Newtonian approximation, expanding retardations or uh, uh, propagators in the post Newtonian sense, and they must be, they must, it must be this way, they must be eliminated by uh, contributions uh, coming from the radiative sector, the back reaction of the exterior tail effect or homogeneous solution I was talking about in one of my first slides. So here, uh, there is, for instance, a quadrupole, a quadrupolar graviton emitted interacting with the, the total mass of the system and re-entering the, the, the system. And this uh, has a conservative part. Uh, this is actually in the uh, schwinger keldish approach. But this has a conservative part, which is important for us. Of course, uh, we use all the same regularization, which is the dimensional regularization. Uh, but we use it in different ways. Uh, so in the focal Lagrangian approach, UV divergences of the local part of the actions are eliminated by redefining the positions of the bodies. Uh, the finite part regularization is kept, and at the end, there is a perfect cancellation of poles, notably some UV uh, cancels IR poles. In the diagrammatic approach, uh, the poles are tracked more carefully uh, so there are UV divergences eliminated by uh, adding innocuous counter terms. Infrared divergences are, are transformed into UV divergences carefully by tracking the pole nature of some vanishing te self terms. They are vanishing, but they are made of one over epsilon UV minus one over epsilon IR, where epsilon is D minus three, D is the dimension. And this procedure is called the uh, zero bin subtraction. Uh, and then you add some UV divergence exterior zone counter terms, the ones coming from the, the back reaction of, of the same type of those ones. And at the end, you get a finite result. In the uh, ADM approach, the UV poles are uh, treated in a very simple way since they are just total time derivatives. However, because no tail formulation is available in D dimensions, uh, in the ADM approach, uh, there is an unknown coefficient related to the finite part associated to the IR pole, and this unknown coefficient was determined using a matching procedure with uh, gravitational self-force results. Uh, yes, so at the end, we find the same, completely the same result after some struggle. So um, uh, the Hamiltonian approach in, uh, in the context of post-Newtonian formalism goes as follows. So you have the usual three plus one splitting of space-time. You introduce the labs, the shift. Uh, T equal constant is one of the surfaces of the foliation. And uh, this is the form of the metric. This is the induced metric of one of those surfaces. And uh, you assume at space infinity that the metric uh, deviates from the flat metric by one over R quantities, and you can differentiate uh, with respect to the space uh, to get some one over R square dependence. And it turns out that uh, using those boundary conditions, you can keep track of the uh, boundary terms uh, in the construction of the Hamiltonian, which is a functional uh, notably of the induced metric and its conjugate momentum. You have here Lagrange multiplier, the matter variables, recognize the bulk Hamiltonian of GR. This is the surface term I was talking about. Uh, we use ADMTT gauge where uh, the induced metric can be decomposed into a conformally flat part and HTT part, uh, which is 
transverse and trace-free. You have also an additional gauge condition which tells you that the trace of uh, the momentum, conjugate momentum I at J0. Constraints coming from the Lagrange multiplayer are H equals zero, HI equals zero, which are equivalent to some elliptic equation for the scalar potential here phi, and the vector part of phi ij, phi i. And so you have, ah, two minutes, okay. Uh, uh, very good. So, uh, in fact, you can uh, obtain an Hamiltonian of function of ATT and pi TT only uh, for the gravitational field. The equations of motion are not canonical, but you can combine them to have uh, actually a wave type equation. You, you can solve it. This shows that HTT is 2pn of 2pn order. Uh, performing a Legendre transformation, you can then transform your Hamiltonian into Russian. And this version can be reduced in the Fokker way, exactly like the Lagrangian, as I explained before, and you obtain at the end a Hamiltonian depending only on the, the particles. So I will skip that, saying just that uh, uh, the Hamiltonian approach uh, is very interesting, probably the most efficient approach to deal with the equations of motion, but quite bad to deal with the problem of the exterior zone. Uh, notably, uh, the, the UV poles are very nice, and it can be used also uh, on perfect fluids in general relativity. So I have one minute maybe to tell you about cell force. So uh, this is um, a black hole of mass m and a smaller particle of mass small m uh, orbiting uh, about it. Uh, epsilon here is the small parameter of the problem, and because uh, the, the, of the presence of this small mass, the background is perturbed, so you have Einstein equation gauge condition. Here uh, you can expand the metric in this form, where epsilon is the, form in this, the small parameter. The H also depends functionally uh, implicitly on the world line expansion. This is the form of the cell force expansion. It turns out that uh, the relevant time for us is the inspiraling time. It's the order one over epsilon. And so this is natural to introduce two time scale, one uh, orbital time scale, let's say, and it's a fast time scale and a slower time scale, which is T times epsilon. And then because of those two time scales, there is a difference between the, the, the phase and uh, this quantity, which is one over uh, of epsilon. And so the, the first correction is proportional to one over epsilon. This is the leading order of the phase. And then the next correction is uh, proportional to epsilon zero and the reminder to epsilon. Uh, so this phi zero is adiabatic, phi one is post adiabatic uh, with notably the contribution of the second order orbit average cell force. So you have this hierarchy of equation to solve, H1 at first order, when we know H1, you inject here it and you solve at the next order, second order, which is very difficult. To uh, handle this equation, you must uh, first expand the box operator, which is not flat here uh, in terms of epsilon, and then you obtain an expression for the singular part of H2, and you can uh, recast the original equation in this form where now you solve for the regular part of uh, H2. So this is much easier. This can be handled only numerically. And in fact, uh, this part already is complicated uh, due to the presence of a coupling here between two puncture singular parts. But if you treat it analytically, uh, you can simplify the problem. Uh, it's also delicate to ensure the non-incoming wave condition. You need asymptotic matching. And you need also to differentiate uh, this, which is delicate, uh, but the best way to do it is to use the derivative with respect to uh, the parameters of the problem. And so the ongoing work is on quasi-circular orbits. Also, we would like to go to uh, more generic orbits. We are now at second order, as I said. Uh, it's a comparison with post-Newtonian calculations is also very interesting. I did this, didn't discuss about it, but notably the energy in the first gravitational cell force approach compared with the ADM approach was able to, um, to compute or to, to provide the, the unknown coefficient in the ADM approach. Uh, this is where we are for the post-Newtonian approach. So mainly 4 pn for the equations of motion and even some piece of 5pn, 4pn for the spinning effects. 
uh, tidal effects are 2 pn for the flux of phases this is a bit less let's say 3.5 ps for pn for uh, point particles for spinning objects we are not yet at 4 pn tidal effects are almost there at 2 pn and tidal effects we spin 1.5 pn and for the amplitudes we are even less uh, 3 pn uh, for point particles and 2 pn for spinning objects but this is just a collection of results the most important things are the techniques and where we are at, uh, for the techniques Thank you. Thank you for the uh, for a summary of the various ingredients involved. Uh, so we have th around three minutes for uh, questions. Satya. Uh, at every post Newtonian order, there seems to be some divergence. Do you think there is a systematic way of identifying how to cure the divergence, or do you have to invent something? No. Different every time. Uh, I think um, in a recent paper, um, uh, notably Ricardo and other people, Rafael Porto um, uh, and Rothstein and also Fofa, uh, they uh, showed a systematic way uh, to uh, deal with the divergences. I think this way is quite equivalent to our way in the sense that they add counter terms and we perform a shift on the position of the particles. In fact, it's not difficult to see that this is uh, completely equivalent. You can prove it's equivalent. But the advantage of adding counter terms, in my opinion, is that you can do it at the level of the action in a covariant way. And because it's covariant, you enforce the covariance and you can predict what are the poles that are going to appear in the next order. So this is a, an advantage of the technique. And apart from uh, UV and IR poles, we don't expect, uh, I mean, the ones I, uh, I discussed before, we don't expect anything else, except that at 5 p.m. there will be tidal effects. And so there will be definitely poles coming from, physical poles coming from uh, the fact that we have to uh, model uh, tidal effects for things which are point particles in this formalism. But those poles uh, can be reabsorbed by uh, an appropriate redefinition, a renormalization of uh, tidal related quantities. And th this is interesting. This may, uh, uh, I think there are some arguments I never completely understood between uh, Damour and Poisson about whether such counter terms could uh, make uh, effectively the love numbers of black holes not, not to be zero, e even in the frequency zero limit. But okay. I'm not sure about that, but anyway, the, the best is to do the calculation and to see what happens. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask a clarification. Uh, for the calculation at 4 p.m., um, you were emphasizing that uh, in the computation with uh, ADM formalism, they had to uh, fix some term uh, using uh, um, self-force results, so terms that are linear in, I think, in new, in the symmetric mass ratio. But that was not the case with the other two approaches. No. So could you actually, in just a few words, um, maybe it's, I'm sure, very technical, but so why, uh, what's the main reason of the difference between... Uh, we'll tell you what I think, but maybe Piotr will uh, have another more, uh, I mean, thoughtful comments. What I think is that, um, uh, the Hamiltonian approach has not been extended uh, to deal with the exterior zone problem. And because the, the tail effect is a back reaction of the exterior zone problem onto the inner zone problem, uh, they cannot easily, I mean, per perhaps this can be done, but not easily immediately, uh, use uh, a similar technique, which is a matching te technique with uh, multipolar post Minkowskian expansion. Uh, in, in principle, it's perhaps possible. Uh, also, um, the ADM gauge is not very good for that because it mixes elliptic and hyperbolic equations. So instead of having a nice hierarchy of hyperbolic equations, like in harmonic coordinates, you have a mixture of elliptic and harmonic, and you cannot easily make general statements about the structure of the gravitational field and, and so on. But, Maybe if you go only to 4 p.m. and not try to do a general formalism, maybe something is possible. I don't know if Piotr... Yeah, 
Can I comment? Yes. Uh, maybe to simplify a bit what was very complicated in, in uh, Guillaume's uh, answer. Uh, technically speaking, uh, the Hamiltonian, uh, the force post Newtonian order is the sum of the uh, near zone instantaneous in time part and the non local in time tail related part. Uh, the tail related part is very small compared to the rest. And we have computed in ADM the near zone Hamiltonian in D dimensions, whereas we take the, say, uh, three dimensional formula for the tail contribution. So we haven't developed D dimensional version of the tail contribution to the Hamiltonian. This was the reason why we have uh, to fight with this one ambiguity parameter, one number. It was just one number. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think I'll be here. Uh, this is more tricky because uh, uh, in our approach, uh, dimensional regularization is perfect for removing UV divergences only. But we have also infrared divergences related with the uh, post-Newtonian expansion of some uh, retarded intervals. And this was the problem. Okay, thanks.